Morning. Morning. Is that mic right down there where your where your mouth is? Oh, all right. Okay. About there? Yes. That better? Yes. Right. Well, um, I think we better open in prayer because I'm shaking. And this ought to be easy because this is about me and him. Father God, I'm your servant and Father God, I lift this to you. I need this to be your words. I need this to be your message. And... Uh, I need you to be with me. I ask you to open the ears and the hearts of the people that will listen, both here today and on the internet at a later date. And I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, the opportunity to live my life for you. Amen. Okay, well, I've got a confession to make. I've got a confession to make today. I'm a chicken. <laughs> it's true. The bullies at school when I was little, they told me repeatedly, you're a chicken, which in England means you're, you're scared, you're a coward. I, I would see them coming and I would run away and go hide. And I would believe that I was a chicken because I ran away and I hid. But actually I found out much later in life it actually wasn't true. Because I would gather myself and I would go back into the playground, I'd still be watching for them and I'd still run away again if they came anywhere near me, but I would go back into the playground. I didn't self-harm, I didn't run away from home, um, I didn't do any of those things that you can do when you're under that sort of pressure. Um, I was actually brave, but I was 45 years old before I knew that. I was a disappointment, this guy's a bit of a disappointment, as a, as a bird he can't fly. He's a bit crazy looking and uh, he's useful in that, well, he's not useful, but most of them are useful because they lay eggs, but that's about the only good thing you can say about chickens. Anybody who's looked after them knows how crazy they are. So, and I was a disappointment to my mum and dad, my mum in particular. And for the first 44 years of my life, I lived my life as if I was a disappointment. I believed it, I was second class, and if I ever found myself actually winning or leading or doing anything good, I would spoil it on purpose to be second. I would back out of it because I couldn't cope with being good, because I was a disappointment, I was a chicken. And that's how I lived the, f the first 44 years of my life. And it's a lie, but I lived it. When I was 45, my first wife had left me for somebody else. I got three kids at school. And uh, I was looking after Auntie Maud. Everybody should have an Auntie Maud. She kind of brushed me down and put me back on my feet so many times. I don't know how I coped without her. She was housebound. She was in her late 80s. And I looked after her. And on the wall in her lounge was a picture of footprints on a beach. And on that picture there were some words. And I'd looked at this picture for the 10 years it had hung there, but I'd never read the words. And on one day, one awful day when I was falling apart again. Somebody came round the back. Nobody ever came to the front door at Auntie Maud's. Somebody came round the back and I saw them coming and I was crying so I went in the lounge while she got rid of them. 
And on that day I read the words. And I don't have the words with me, but that was me. That was my life. That was my story. It was me he was carrying when there was only one set of footprints. Me. There was a God. There was. He'd been speaking to me for 44 years and I'd never heard him. I didn't listen. But on that day I listened. On that day I heard him. And from that day onwards, I spoke to him. I talked to him about my, about my uh, problems. I talked to him about the idea that if you were in that much emotional pain, if you were going through something that was so overwhelming you couldn't cope with it, my wife had left me. You should be able to die from that sort of pain because that's what I wanted to do. That was the next one. The good news is God thinks I'm an eagle. I can't see it. I'm convinced I'm a chicken. But God thinks I'm an eagle. My life was changing. I started to do things that were to reinvent me, if you like, to find out who Stephen really was. I, I went to dancing classes. I was horrible. I was a chicken at dancing classes. <laughs> but I met some nice people. I, uh, I started to research my family history. Yeah, the guy at the school uh, who was running the course said, uh, on the first day, the first evening I went, he said, you need to be aware that you might find things out about your family history that you don't know. That's really upsetting. He told a story about a vicar who was in one of his classes and uh, he found that one of his uh, ancestors had been hung at Tyburn for murder. And that really upset this vicar. Um, I found a sister that I didn't know I had, a half-sister. And, and that caused me a lot of problems because my mom and dad never told me. They were both gone by this point. So what was it about me that they couldn't trust me with this information? You know, I, I go back to feeling like a chicken. I was in that sort of transition period between my life before I was 45 and my life since. And Isaiah chapter 40, not no, Psalm 40 rather, Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will hear and see and put their trust in the Lord. And I needed that. I didn't read it at the time, but this is what I needed. My, my life needed God, it needed that firm rock, it needed something to stand on, and um, I needed to get out of the mud. I, I have this picture of the mud still sticking to my pants, trousers as we call them in England, and, and to me, but I wasn't in it anymore. I started talking to God. I, I cut grass for a living. I was a gardener, but most of what I did was to cut grass for people. And I would look up into the sky and I would find a little patch of blue in the, in the clouds. And I would just talk to that patch of blue sky. There's a lot of clouds in England. 
it's a miserable place. <laughs> so, but this transformed my life because I, I'd run out of friends that would listen to me because I'd been doing this for three years. But slowly but surely, me and God, we, we left that place. God speaks to me in pictures. And later on, he gave me a picture, and this, is, this was the beginning of it. He, I had this picture, and on this side of the picture, in my mind, was a desert. And I was sitting in the middle of it. And God walked into my desert and picked me up and carried me to the middle of the picture where there was a green hill and a cross and he, he showed me the cross and he introduced me to his son and on this side of the picture is a long valley with mountains on either side of it and it's the valley of life and he bid me walk down the valley of life with my Lord and he is waiting at the end for me that's the picture he gave me and I started living that picture when I was 45 years old in the beginning I didn't really know Jesus or, or the cross or the Bible I didn't go to church I just used to talk to God that was my beginning This is Sutton Coalfield Baptist Church. This is my, my home in England. They have 540 members. Something like 900 people go through it at least once a, a month. It's huge. And it was very, very good because you could get lost in that sort of a crowd. And I needed that because I still felt like a chicken. Um, one of my customers um, said to me, just after my divorce, which was complete in the December of 98, she said, what you need is a, an alpha course. Shaking her finger in my, in my face. And yeah, I thought, yeah, I'll just say yes and she'll just forget about it, you know. I don't really need to do this. Church is a strange place. <laughs> so anyway, she kept on about it. She wouldn't let it go. And in, in the Easter, just after Easter, 1999, I went to Sutton Coalfield Baptist Church. And I did a, an Alpha course on Wednesday evenings. And because of my job, because if the weather was bad, I ran late and, and that, I missed about half of them. So in the fall, I did a second one. And this time, if I was running late, oh well, you know, I went to the Alpha course. It was like somebody put in the lights on. Suddenly this strange place, church, wasn't so strange. The people there weren't crazy. I thought they were before, but they're not. And the strange language they used, you know, the, the, the language of the Bible, the, the language of calling somebody the lamb and all this, it doesn't make any sense to somebody who doesn't go. But it started to make absolute sense to me. And in the October of 1999, I welcomed the, the Lord Jesus into my life. And in the, on the 9th of July 2000, I was baptized in, in that church. And the reason I asked uh, Kelsey to play that uh, song, My Jesus, My Saviour, was they sang that over me when I was baptized. That's a very special song to me. So I'd found Jesus. I'd found God and the Bible and a, a really good church that was so busy I could hide in it.
still feeling very chicken-like. But it was good. And I started to read my Bible. Um, I don't read much. I've read about six books in my whole life. But I do read this one. Not as often as I should, but I do read it. And in the November of 2000, I was at a men's group weekend. 50 of us at a youth hostel in the middle of Derbyshire somewhere. That was lots of fun. And uh, uh, a medical doctor, Dr. David Drew, preached the first evening on Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And I've got that here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Dr. David Drew said, the biggest word in those two verses is therefore. He said it meant, having read, understood, and lived chapters 1 through 11, brothers. So having understood it, having lived it. Well, I hadn't lived it, but it seemed like a good idea to me. My life was getting better, but I really had not a lot. I, I didn't really have a purpose. And in absolute innocence, without a clue what it would actually get me into, I prayed a prayer on that weekend with David Drew that God would accept me as a living sacrifice. I really, truly had no idea what I was letting myself in for. I didn't. So, I'll have the next one. That's St. Martin's Church in the middle of Birmingham. The building on the uh, right-hand side of that picture is the, uh, is the Bullring Shopping Centre, uh, a mall, a very big one. And um, they didn't uh, knock the church down to build the mall, although they, want, although they wanted to. It is the, the center for a lot of the Christian activity in Birmingham, St. Martin's. And um, I would eventually work out of there and one or two other churches in my work with the homeless. Birmingham, England, um, we, we don't use the letter H. So I wear an at, I go home, I, you know, it's Birmingham, there's no H. Um, and it's on the, as you look at the map, it's in the middle, and it's on the uh, right side of the main highway that goes north-south on the west side of England. And on the left side of the highway, uh, there's no sort of farms or anything in between, there's just Birmingham on one side, and the black country, as they call it, on the other. The black country is Wolverhampton and West Bromwich and the towns of the black country. And it's where the industrial revolution started. They have coal, they had iron ore, and they had canals that they built, that they transported stuff on. Um, it's a very strange place, the black country. They talk English, but even I don't understand, and I, I live 10 miles away. Um, 
And uh, of course, Birmingham has the best football team, that's proper football, not what you guys play, uh, in the world. We're not doing very well at the moment, but um, if you cut me open, I would bleed claret and blue. And I know this is sort of iffy, but when you get to heaven, you'll find that God is a Villa fan and heaven is claret and blue. <laughs> and it's not blue and white. And Birmingham City supporters, this is the other team in Birmingham, right? They're not allowed. So there'll be no Birmingham City, blue noses as we call them. There'll be none of them in heaven because, you know, it's a good place. We need him to step up, actually, because the Villa are really not doing very well. Um, I will just say this, though, that, in, I mean, I know it's, it's sort of funny, but football is a religion in England. <laughs> you are born, I was born a Villa fan. My dad and my grandfather before me were Villa fans. You know, you're born into a family, and if you chose to, most of the big cities have two football teams. And if you choose to support the other lot, you'll be ostracized. I mean, you'll, you'll be picked on and ridiculed. And, and I mean, it's serious. I mean, it's, it's every day. When they say in England that when in the closed season, in the summer, when there's no football, the men have nothing to talk to one another about. It's, it's that serious. So I'm, I'm at Sutton Baptist Church and I've prayed my prayer. And Sutton Coalfield Baptist Church at that time did a soup run. They would make sandwiches, soup, uh, tea, coffee, and they would um, take that to Birmingham, which is about a half hour journey, a bit like going from here to Gold Lake, to go to the center of the city. And they would set up their tables and they would feed the homeless on a, the second Tuesday and the fourth Thursday, I think it was. It was like twice a month. And uh, I thought, well, that seems like a good way of being a living sacrifice. So I decided I was going to be part of that. And I did my first one um, in, I think, September of, of, the year, of that year. So I'd already done a couple when I prayed my prayer. Um, but by Christmas of that year, I was not only doing every soup run the, the Southern Baptist Church did, but I was also working with other churches on their soup runs. And I ended up at something called Birmingham Open Christmas. It's a four-day event at a school in the city. And it is for all the people that sleep rough on the streets. And they take them in and they, it's all the, all the food you can eat, three cooked meals a day, a bed on the floor at night, entertainment. Uh, they do your feet, they have a dentist come in, they have haircuts, they, they'll give you a shower, they'll give you, new, you know, a new set of clothes. Uh, all sorts of things go on. It's a wonderful place. And I went for the first time Christmas 2000. And I met a guy called Charles. We were both from the same church, but I didn't know him because there's 500 people there. So, um, And we became firm friends, Charlie and I. We did. And... Um, After that, we, we found ourselves uh, helping and wanting to be volunteers with a, an organization called the Birmingham City Mission. The city missions all over the world, and the one in Birmingham is particularly good. It's a bit like the Salvation Army. It, it's very similar, really. And we, we did become volunteers. We worked on their soup run. And then latterly, we started to work with their resettlement officer. We would visit people that were homeless and had been in the hostel and were now in an apartment somewhere. So we did sort of house visits and all sorts of different things. And um, through 2001 and well into 2002, we, we, this is what we did. 
And we ended up running the super on for Sutton Baptist Church. Um, we, we sort of, we, we were growing. Both of us were growing in our faith and, uh, and in the ways we, we you know, we, um, we served the Lord. Um, just after Christmas 2001, um, the soup run doesn't run while open Christmas is on. So it doesn't run at Christmas. But there was a gap because between Christmas and New Year, they, they had, they, all the churches had a week off. So there were nights when open Christmas had closed, but it wasn't New Year yet. And there was no food. So we made a bread tray full of cheese sandwiches and five gallon of tea, Charlie and I. And we went to the city centre thinking that if there were anybody there, we would feed them. Well, we got there to the bull ring. That's the stuff on the left hand side. That's the bull ring open market. It's famous the world over. And we went there and we, we, we got to uh, the, the tables and that that they sell the vegetables and stuff off are there permanently. So we set up our, our tea and, and coffee and, and our sandwiches on one of them tables. But when we got there, there was a lineup and there were about 80 men and women in this lineup. And we'd only want one, one tray of sandwiches. So I said to Charles, I said, you give a sandwich to each person in the lineup, and I will serve tea. So that's what we did. And he gave the last sandwich out of our tray to the last person in the lineup. But we hadn't got enough food. There weren't enough sandwiches to feed 80 people. But he gave the last sandwich in the box to the last guy in the lineup. And that was the first time I had a hint that I was really an eagle, that God was right, you know? All this time I thought, I mean, he might be God, but he's wrong. And, and that was a very special moment for both of us. I've been there when God has done wonderful things in front of me. But that was, that was the first really, really big one. And we, um, we had a good night that night. I, on our way home, I think we, we didn't travel home in the car. We actually flew home, I think. You know, we were, we were very uh, pumped by that, by, by what God had done in front of us. We were. We had many, there are many stories I can tell about the homeless. Um, we worked for many years, in the early years, with um, a guy called Keith. Keith, uh, Keith was a, a tall, he was about 5'10", five, 5'11", five, but he was only about 85 pounds. His street name was Skeletor because he, he literally looked like a skeleton with, with skin on him. And he was multiply addicted. He was a crack cocaine addict and an opiate addict. He injected. He was the most addicted person I ever met in all my years of working with the homeless. And he was, at one point he was in an apartment on the east side of the city and the local um, drug dealers sort of saw him as an opportunity to be abused. So what they did was they had a, they were growing uh, weed in all the, in all but one of the rooms in his apartment and holding him as a sort of a hostage, really. He wasn't allowed to leave. He wasn't allowed to run away. And he escaped by jumping over a balcony and landing in a bush three floors down. He didn't actually break anything, which was a miracle in itself. And he phoned us 
and we went and rescued him from where, where he was hiding. And my friend Charles took him home the first night. And then we put him in a, in a hotel in a different, a, a cheap place, but in a different part of the city. And we hid him from these drug dealers. And it was a bit like being a part of a film because we thought we were being followed by them, you know, because they wanted him back. What they didn't want was they didn't want him to lose the apartment and then the, the, the authorities would find their, their, them growing weed in it, like, you know, so. This was really serious. It was, you know, one of them life and death things, or could have been. Um, what, what we did in the end was we went and found this uh, drug dealer and we asked to speak to his boss and uh, God granted us that wish. We did get to speak to his boss. And we explained a few things and we talked to this guy and we, we prayed a lot before we went and did this. And we managed to negotiate a deal with this guy that Keith wouldn't give up the apartment until they told us that they'd finished the grow and it was clear. And then he would give up the apartment. And in return, they would leave him alone and stop pursuing him. And, and that's what happened. And we found that remarkable that you could actually do business with people that were scary, that had a, you know, a reputation for being ruthless. And it, it, was, it wasn't a chicken that did that, you know. It was a chicken that went in, but it wasn't a chicken that left. At this time, I, I was also, I have some friends that are missionaries in France, in the Loire Valley, in saint Etienne, And I would go for a couple of weeks uh, in the summer to help them, just for a change, just to, it, it's kind of stressful when you're working with people that are, um, that are so needy, that are so addicted, that are so chaotic. And um, so as part of my looking after me, which I didn't really do a very good job of, but I did go and help my, my friend Wayne in France. I can't speak French. Um, they're, they're kind of strange, the French. But anyway, uh, I was very happy to work there. And the first time I went, I, I met a Spanish guy who was married to a French woman. Um, she was a teacher and she'd done a year teaching in the South Wales Valleys. So she loved tea, which was really good because I like tea. And um, we got on really well. She spoke quite good English and that was good because I don't speak any French at all. Um, and me and the, the Spanish guy, we, we worked with Romanian gypsies that were living in squats in Saint Etienne. And while I was there, um, in 2006, while I was there, um, I, I was restless. I, I'd been working for the city mission as a resettlement officer for a number of years, running a 50-bed hostel for the homeless. And, uh, but I was restless. I, I, I knew God wanted to do something else with me, and, but I didn't know what it was. And. A French minister who didn't know me, who didn't speak English, prayed over me and prophesied over me in French. And the prophecy was that I was at a crossroads and that it was God's crossroads and that I was to dwell at the crossroads and minister to the people that passed through. And I was to wait on God. And this was remarkable because um, this guy didn't know me from Adam. I mean, he didn't, you know, and, he, and we didn't speak the same language or anything. So this was from God. This was definitely eagle, not chicken. And so I did, I did that. I'll have the next one. 
So this is the, a canal in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham is supposed to have more canals than Venice. I, I don't know whether that's actually true or not, but we do have a lot of canals. Um, because Birmingham's in the middle, it, the, they built the canals in the 1700s to move coal and iron ore and, and heavy stuff. Uh, it was the transport system, because the roads obviously back then were hopeless. Um, so Birmingham is the centre of the national canal system, which is now mostly used for pleasure, and the centre of the highway system. Um, all, all the major highways have effectively go through Birmingham, particularly if you're going from the east side to the west side of the country. Um, it, the British Isles isn't very big. If you compacted it down, it would fit something like from the US border to North Battleford. It's less than half the size uh, of Saskatchewan. Um, and 61 million people live there. So if you, I mean, it's impossible, isn't it? If you, if you, you know, even if you've been to Vancouver or Toronto, it's impossible to really imagine that many people living in that smaller space. And big parts of it are not populated at all. Half of Scotland's empty, you know, so. But anyway, um, in 2007, it became obvious to me what God wanted me to do. Um, I had a, a nice job, I had a monthly salary, um, I had lots of support, I had lots of friends, I had a purpose, uh, and this was my job at the city mission. I'd given up being a, a gardener back in 2002, and, and I, I'd accepted their offer of being a, a, a resettlement officer. Um, and it was really good, and I, I was good at it. God provided me with gifts that, you know, were really sort of suitable for the job. But what God wanted me to do was to leave that, to leave that support, that financial sort of security and everything about it, and live by faith and work on the streets, where he was my only boss and he would pay the bills. And I did that in 2007. Uh, my buddies all thought I was crazy. Uh, you'll be back, they said. Yeah. The chicken in me really sort of thought, yeah, that's quite possible really, but I'm going to give it a go because God thinks I'm an eagle. I still don't believe it at this point, but, you know. I'd had eagle moments, though. I had. Those, um, it was, uh, the bit out of uh, Isaiah was uh, on the screen but when we came in, you know. Those who trust in the Lord will soar on wings like eagles. And I'd done that a few times, I had, but I still thought I was a chicken. So I started what we call street to home. Street because that's where I found them, and a home because everybody deserves one. But the home side of it isn't as obvious as it might appear. It's not the picket fence and, you know, the job and the car and the wife and the two kids. Because most of the people I worked with weren't capable of that. So what we used to do if you can imagine that you're living on the fifth floor of a multi-story parking lot in the center of the city. You're not living on the sixth floor because there's no roof, right? So you live on the fifth floor because the sixth floor is your roof. But we would teach them to go around every day and pick up all the garbage and bag it up and leave it by the stairs not to leave their cans and their bottles about, or their syringes and their needles, but to clean the place, to treat it like it's home. And if you can teach somebody to look after their corner of a parking lot, then you've got them halfway to being able to come in off the streets 
to come in and give up their f the, the freedom that there is in being homeless. It's a very special freedom. And it's not really easy to explain. You've got to live it to be able to understand what I'm going to talk about. But for them to give, give up that freedom and to come in and live in a hostel and prepare themselves to get an apartment, to prepare themselves to rejoin society. What I did at this point was, I had a friend called Joseph. Joseph was a Christian man who lived homeless so that he could work one-to-one -one with homeless people. He lived with them and ministered to them. One of the most remarkable Christians I ever met. At this point in 2007, 2008, he'd been homeless five years already. And he lived in a, an arch, a railway arch, under Moore Street Railway Station. And what I did was I asked the homeless whether they, whether they would take offence if I lived homeless for two or three weeks to try to find out what it was like. I didn't want to disrespect them. I, I, I wanted their approval. And I got the approval. They all thought I was crazy as well. But um, So with Joseph looking after me, I lived in that railway arch for just over two weeks. I gave my apartment keys, my wallet, my, my cell phone, my everything that was of any value to me. I gave them all to my son and I showed him the arch. I said, this is where I am if you need me. And I was visiting a, an old guy who had come through the hostel and we got him an apartment. He was an old guy. And I got him into a senior's place in um, Castle Bromwich. And I visited him on a Thursday night. And I got my, my, my bag with me, my, my hold all with me with everything in it that I needed and a sleeping bag on the top. I'd got about two pounds in 20 pence coins uh, in my pocket and that was all I'd got. And I told John what I was about to do. And as he put me on the bus after our meeting, he said to me, don't fall in love with it. He said, being homeless is like a woman. It's beguiling like a woman. Don't fall in love with it. And I thought to myself, I thought, John has finally actually lost it completely. He needs mental health support now. But after two days of living in that arch with, with Joseph, I knew exactly what he was talking about. There is something special about that lifestyle. There's a freedom which you do not find anywhere else. A lot of people live it because they're addicted or, or because they're mentally ill and a lot of them can't cope with ordinary life. But, and it, it'll kill you. They, the, the statistics say that you'll die in your mid to late 40s if you're homeless and addicted. And that's... That's actually a shorter lifespan than, uh, than, the, um, th than the third world. But that's, that's what they say, and actually that, that's my experience. And I lived with Joseph for two, two and a half weeks. Uh, and afterwards, I, I was really blessed. And, and this is a, a, an eagle moment because the homeless said to me that I was an honorary homeless person because I'd lived it. They understood that I'd got an apartment to go back to and a life and a car and everything. But the, the fact that I stuck it out for more than two days, the fact that I stayed with it, the fact that I learned what it was like so that I could help people that were new to it, so that I could help the people that were there for years, with actually what they needed, not what I thought they needed. And this was very much a, a, an ego thing because I, 
I put myself as a servant, if you like. I put myself, it's like Jesus came as a baby and I tried to do the Jesus thing. I tried to be humble about it. I tried to be a servant about it. I was doing it to learn and I did that. I have many stories and I could talk forever and I realize it's gone off 11 and I might have to pull this sort of uh, together a bit, but um, just one story from the, the time when I was um, living by faith. Um, I previously, when I was at the hostel, evicted a drug dealer from the hostel for fighting. When I addict, evicted him, he got a gun in his pocket. And just, I did this just before I, I resigned my position. And after I'd resigned, I bumped into him in the street. And he said to me, he said, I'll have to clean this up because a lot of, you know, sort of uh, flowery language in, in actually what he said. But what he said to me in essence was that I was uh, brave. And he said, because you knew I was tooled up you know, I knew he'd got a gun in his pocket. I also knew that he wasn't going to use it on me. But he thought I was very brave. He said, you were on your own. Because the, the other guy that I was on duty with that took the other guy who was bleeding and, and, I mean, he'd done a real number on this kid. So he took him away. So he, in essence, I was in, I was in this situation on my own. And he said to me, you were on your own. And I said, no, I said, I'm never on my own. I said, I had Jesus with me at all, all through that, all through everything I do, I had Jesus with me. And he, um, he says, well, he was a black kid. And uh, he said, well, respect, he says, which is huge for them. And you do the black handshake, which I, it's a bit like dancing the wall. So I can do it as long as you know what we're doing. You know, I can do the black handshake as long as he knew what I was doing. Um, I, when, I, when he suddenly appeared, appeared before me in the, in the streets, I was scared. I, I was a chicken again. Um, but I left an eagle because I thought, I'm respected by a drug dealer. This is kind of big, you know. They're illegal. What they do is illegal, but they're not all monsters. And this guy proved himself to be human as well as a drug dealer because I went into Latif's. This is a sort of a Costco type of place um, in Birmingham. And uh, Latif came down from his office. Now, he doesn't speak to anybody. This, this guy's God, you know. And he says to me, he says, you're Stephen, the homeless guy. And I said, yes, Mr. Latif. And he said, you go with my boy, he says. He says, uh, Billy's been in. Not his real name, of course. Billy's been in, he says. Can you get 50 sleeping bags in your car? No, Mr. Latif, I said, but I can come back a second time. And this, this drug dealer had been in and paid for 50 sleeping bags. I mean, it, it just, it, it's just beggar's belief, really. That somebody in that trade, somebody who's perceived as that evil, you know, would buy sleeping bags to keep the homeless alive at night. I mean, it's just, it's eagle all the way. It is. So this picture is the Sally. Um, I, I came to uh, Canada in 2011 to marry Darcy. My sister... Corinne has lived in Red Deer, Alberta for 40 years and she lived next door to a lady, to actually to my wife and they were both young married women and they had their kids at the same time and they became like sisters, they're beyond friends, you know. And I met Darcy when my nephew got married back in 2008 and we emailed one another and it's a long story, but you know, we got married on 13th of August, 2011.
That's why I live here. That's why I left England, my kids, my grandkids, my, my mission for God and everything. I came here to marry Darcy. Um, I, I'm very happily married. My Darcy's not that well, really, but, but we're, we're very happy. And in 2011, in the January, I, I went to the Sally and I saw Harvey Lomax and I talked to him about a little bit about my life and I talked to him about um, wanting to help, wanting to sort of semi-retire. I was 60 at the time, uh, but wanting to use what God had given me in a, some small way here. So I've worked for the Sally for most of the last five years, not quite all of it. Um, I, uh, I'll have the next one. And this is remand in the Regina Provincial Correctional Centre. Um, it looks a bit like the set from uh, Elvis's song uh, Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Um, during part of my time working with the Sally, I, I was uh, there for two years. I was their court worker. And uh, during that time, I started to visit the people that I saw go through the court and then go to prison. And I worked with Sandra. And um, Sandra invited me a couple of years ago to actually join the team and to be a volunteer chaplain a pro properly, not just a visitor. So um, I, I only go twice a month. Um, that's also altered by her availability. I only have um, a, a pass to work in the uh, prison um, with somebody with me. So I can only go around the prison with Sandra. I can't walk around on my own. That's the, the, the limitation to my work in the prison. But what she does is she takes me to remand or some other part of the prison and then leaves me with a pile of, of requests to, from the prisoners to see a chaplain. And then I sit and I work my way through. Um, it, it's really good. It, it's, it's really good to be able to continue. And I work sort of three days a week for the Sally and one one day every two weeks uh, in the prison. Um, but it's really good to, to use what I have from England, what, I, what God taught me, yeah, on the, this journey that he took me from chicken to eagle. You know, I still don't look on myself as an eagle. You know, I still sort of very aware of my chicken sort of nature, but, but God makes me an eagle because he does wonderful things in front of me. You know, people see Jesus in what I do. And um, I've talked for too long, but I, I'm going to sort of end it with the last picture. And my pitch is, however you see yourself, whether you see yourself as a, a chicken like I do or anything else, God can make you an eagle. He can. I'm very ordinary and... There's nothing remarkable about me. There really isn't. I'm not putting myself down. There really isn't. And if he can make me an eagle, he can make anybody in this room and anybody who watches the video an eagle. He can. You just have to be prepared to pray the prayer that he will use you as a living sacrifice. I prayed that prayer in 2006 after that French minister prophesied over me. I prayed it knowing what some of what I was going to lose, knowing some of what it was going to cost me to be a sacrifice. And then I left my job and I worked on the streets for those years, completely relying on God. I never sweat my rent once. He always paid my rent. He always paid the utilities. The flat was freezing cold, but because we couldn't have, me and God, we couldn't afford gas. So <laughs> there was no heat. And, and in the winter, it was about seven degrees in my apartment. But that was okay. You can go to bed with your clothes on and you're warm straight away. So. But God can do this. He can do this in your life. 
He can take you to places that you would never have dreamt about, as he did with me. I uh, thank you for listening. And I'm sorry I've gone on too long. But, and if anybody's got any questions at all, I, I've only used about two-thirds of what I've got written down here. So, you know, either now or later. I, I, I love it here. I do. I, I love it on the prairie. I love being married to my Darcy. And I love being able to come here on a Sunday morning. And I'm very happy to be part of this church. But I want you to know who I am and, and what God did. And something of my journey. And that's why I've done this. I'm in very, very good company. Because this book is full of chickens. But maybe that's a talk for another day. Thank you.